as you can see that today we are going to uh, have the final review of the uh, sutta. You may have seen that uh, I have uh, given you a blog post where you see uh, uh, all the notes in one blog post, so you can uh, go and check them. Are you ready to answer any questions that I may have for you? So, uh, Dhamma Chakra Pautana Sutta is regarded, uh, as regarded as the first uh, sutta which the Buddha taught uh, anybody else, I would say, uh, in this case, uh, five ascetics. And uh, we know that uh, in this sutta, what we noticed was that uh, only one uh, monk. So can we call that monk as a Buddhist monk or a monk? Okay. The word called Samana. Samanas were existed, existing even uh, before the Buddha's time, right? Uh, do you know the difference between Samana and, and the Brahmins? Probably not, right? Uh, you know, uh, in ancient India, they had this, uh, the Brahmins. The Brahmins uh, always thought that they would listen to the uh, Vedas, right? Vedas. So the Vedas cannot be questioned. Vedas are Vedas. I'm talking about the time, I would say, uh, uh, I would say uh, 1500, uh, 1500 uh, BC, right? So, so that means uh, BCE, that means 1500 years before the Shakyamuni Buddha's time. But later on, probably uh, somewhere, probably a couple hundred uh, centuries before the Shaktimani Buddha's time, uh, some people, individuals thought that we are not going to understand the reality from these books that, that have been asked us to, uh, I would say, uh, believe that we, we must believe what it is, what they are, right? That kind of a uh, notion should not be accepted anymore. So we have to search uh, through our personal, uh, what you call mental pursuits. So they are called a new tradition. We call them as uh, Samana tradition. What is it called? Samana, Samana tradition. Now Samana tradition is very interesting because uh, they are the ones who divided from the Vedic tradition where they talk about that uh, uh, we can create a mental connection to uh, our search, uh, uh, you know, truth, truth search, and then uh, find the liberation at a certain point. Uh, do you remember that Prince Siddhartha saw one uh, monk, remember, in, in, uh, uh, in his childhood? which turned him to think about something else in his life. It is said that he saw four uh, omens, I would say prognostications. He called him as a sick person, uh, an elderly person, a corpse uh, we carried by a couple of people, and then a monk. So who is this monk? That means somebody from the Sramana tradition. So, Shramana tradition was existing even before the Buddha's time. So, we can understand that these five ascetics uh, must have practiced one of uh, the, one of the schools of the Shramana traditions. Anyways, only Kondanya was able to become a Sota. The rest was not able to understand the Dhamma in that perspective. All right, so let's take a look at the sutta again, the first day. All right, so uh, first day, what uh, happened was that we uh, discussed about the text a little bit uh, in details, I mean the context. As you can see, I have uh, divided the text into uh, the background story, that is the first one, setting the wheel of the Dhamma in motion. And we said that there is something interesting, Dhamma Chakra. 
Pavatan. Chakka is Dharma wheel. Chakka is wheel. And Pavatan is uh, what you call motion. Right? Now let me ask you. Where is this Dhamma Chakra in the Sutta? Now you, you might imagine a Dhamma Chakra, like a very nominal Dhamma Chakra. You see Dhamma Chakra with some spokes. But what kind of Dhamma Chakra is being discussed in this Sutta? Where is the Dhamma Chakra, Dhamma chakra teaching the, the Sutta? I will give you a clue. Let's go back here. Day Day 18, we discuss an interesting teaching about the Four Noble Truths. We discuss that the Four Noble Truths is being discussed within a framework of three perspectives and 12 aspects, Tipari Vata and Dwada Sanka. And remember that uh, teaching? Tipari Vata, Dwada Sanka. It is because of the Tiparivatta and Dwada Sakara that we call that there is a Dhamma Chakra. Because it is an uh, you know ancient teaching where the wheel is being used to talk about the most important teachings. Now here, Dhamma Chakra has to be understood as a framework of the Tiparivatta Dwada Sakara. Uh, we, because some people have a misunderstanding that Buddha make a Buddha made a dhamma chakra and then he, uh, you know, uh, sent forth uh, his monks and that, that is how he actually uh, brought this dhamma to uh, different places. Uh, it is true, it is what we see in the history, but uh, dhamma chakra in this particular sutta, dhamma chakra Pautra sutta, alludes to the Tiparivatta and Vada Sakara framework of the honorable truths, right? Let's keep that in mind. All right, so the first is the sutta and then the background story. And then there, there Buddha talks about uh, that uh, uh, monks, monks should not search to paths. What are the two paths that any monk should not follow? What are they? Kama Sukhalikana Yoga and Atta Kilamatana Yoga. Now we will learn a little bit more what they are. We discuss Kama Sukhalikana Yoga to be the summarized version of an extreme in indulgence to the sensual pleasures, especially now. Uh, Monks are not supposed to uh, even to tend to karmas, but uh, lay people, they may have to use some level of calm, healthy calms, right? But they are not supposed to cling to the karmas, right? What, what does uh, clinging mean here? To greed, probably a greed toward the sensual object. Can we use can we be in the company of anybody? Can we use an object without the greed of that particular object? Can we? We can, but it is a tough work, tough task, but it is possible, right? So Kamsa Kalkanita means never follow any path that is uh, uh, already uh, falling into the excessive sensuality, right? And then the second one is Atta Kilamathana Yoga. As for the Atta Kilamathana Yoga, what we learned was the Buddha asked monks not to follow extreme sealers, excessive sealers. We call it in other Pali word. What do we call in Pali? Seelabhata Paramahasam. We need sealer, but we should not practice any extreme sealer. Can somebody tell me how can someone uh, practice extreme sealer? Now, you know that uh, at the beginning of any ceremony, you are going to take precepts. When you go to a retreat, you are taking eight precepts, right? 
then you have to go to a puja, you take the five precepts. So, sila is normal to us, right? It's no harm. But when can a sila become an extreme level? That should be stopped. Because the next level of sila is sama. If you are following sila too much, not too much, I would say excessive, unnecessarily, then you are going to miss out on the samadhi part. Then, even at the level of samadhi, if you are only focusing on samadhi, you are not going to uh, think about the next level of samadhi, that means panya, that my samadhi, my meditation should continue to samadhi. Not just samadhi, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm peaceful, no, only on that teaching. That doesn't make any sense. Why we are practicing meditation after sila? It is to concentrate us. But what is the price of a mere concentration? Right? Because when I go back home, when you go back home, you will get changed again. Then my meditation should go beyond samadhi, panya, sila, samadhi, panya. Never end up at sila, never end up at samadhi. Panya is the book. Then, why did the Buddha talk about Attakilamutan Yoga? Because Attakilamutan Yoga means these people never indulge in karma. You look at the five ascetics, they are giving so much pain to the body. They haven't had a shower for, uh, I think, for more than decades. They had the, what do you call, uh, uh, dirt like a pillar in some of the sutras uh, Buddha talks about. And then they they are naked. And they said that uh, we, we don't wear clothes because we have no attachments to their clothes. The Buddha said that doesn't make any sense. People wear clothes not just to tell them, not, not to tell others that we have no attachments, so we have attachments. Right? Now, in the next sutta that we are going to discuss, uh, there is a section talk about the purpose of our clothing so, so at the same time uh, James had a lot of uh, excessive practices so they are reflections about uh, extreme sin right so you are merely keeping away from killing keeping away from what you call stealing uh, and then you are uh, loving and taking care of your family your spouse your children that is a must that is what we see in the Sigalova the Sutta, that is what we see in the Mangala Sutta, right? And then that is what we see in the Kamisumicha Chara, right? And then you are not uh, a liar, you are, you are practicing your truthfulness. At the same time, you are not clouding your mind with unnecessary things. So, when, if you do these five intentionally, then you have to see. Then, you have to focus on the next level of the seal. The next level of the seal is what will benefit me from this seal? Uh, now, I think my mind is not that distracted. That is why in the Western mindfulness, they are having some issues. In the Western mindfulness, most of the Western mindfulness uh, teachers don't talk about seal at mind because you can't talk about seal over there. Don't tell me what to do, right? Teach me meditation. Don't tell me what to do, what not to do. So, so sila has been mostly ignored in many places. There may be places, but mostly. Then what happens, whatever the mistakes such people may have done because of not practicing the sila will pop up as distractions in the meditation. That is why sila is important just to the extent of not getting you distracted. And then the next level, next level is Samadhi. Samadhi, what we understand is just to calm our thoughts, but not to like jhana so much. Huh? This, is a, this is the next issue a lot of people face. A lot of people, they end up with sila. Some other few people, they get stuck at the jhanas. I like first jhana, the second, third, fourth, and, <laughs> and then they get stuck to the jhana. Well, you might develop some jhanas, you might, you may, but jhanas is, jhanas are not sammasati. They are samadhi. It is something beyond the jhanas. 
You are not simply looking for bliss, happiness of your mind. You are looking for crossing the sansara, right? It is like that you choose one or the other. You don't like this and you choose this one. They all are part of the samsari thing. Anyways, now going back to Attakelamutami Yoga, what the Buddha said was that he simply said, these are two ends. Attakelamutami Yoga means extreme sila. You don't need extreme sila. Practice sila, but don't be extreme. Enjoy your karmas, but don't be too much into karmas. Make your levels. But for the monastics, they can do it in a better way, right? So by not falling into these two ends, you would find out the happiness, the true happiness. How does it well uh, relate to the lay people? Though? Now, is this sutta given to the lay people? Let's check it out. Huh? Some people might try to think that this is for the lay people. See here. Dwe me pikkave anta pabbajite na. Interesting. Pabbajite. Because these two extremes should not be followed by one who has gone forth into pabbaj. Pabbajite. Now, does it relate to lay people over here? But the clearance says that pabbajite, those monastics, should not fall into either of ends but you can learn lay people can practice it in their own way there's no harm but if you look at a more committed practice for the monastics they can understand that they should not fall into either areas what did we discuss after that these are the ends that uh, we should not fall into and then we discuss about the middle path right and then we discuss about the first noble truth and the second noble truth third noble truth fourth noble truth at the end of discussing the fourth noble truth we came to the most important uh teaching of the dhamma chakra what is it what is that teaching I already uh, shared with you at the beginning, Tipari Vatta and Vada Sakara teaching of the Four Noble Truths. Four Noble truth, Truths teaching has to be understood through Tipari Vatta and Vada Sakara. We will study a little bit again as a review. And then what happened was that, right, it, that teaching. Uh, the framework of uh, the Parivata Dwada Sakana for the Four Noble Truths uh, goes as far as uh, 117, section 117. And then we understand Venerable Pandanya uh, became a Sotapanna at the end. And then what happened as a result of this first Dhamma teaching, because this is the first Dhamma teaching, the, the influence of the teaching went to heavens, deva worlds, as a cry, as a cry means Sadda Manusa Veso. What does it mean? The devas, brahmas started to feel that something that never happened, happened. So they were like so much surprised and, and something came out of their mouth, like a cry, something happened, something we didn't feel before happened. So it started from the human world into the Chatu Maharajika, then it went as far as the uh, final Deva world and then went up to the Brahma world, ended up with the last Brahma world. And then we discuss about Brahma world. That's the end. That's what we discuss about the Sutta. So the first day, it was about the an introduction about the text and from the second day onwards we discuss uh, the important matters uh, one by one because today we are going to look at uh, the whole um, Sutta Sutta as a review I would like to discuss some of the very important teachings look at it down we took 20 days to uh, finish the Dhammachakapatana Sutta Right. And it's not just uh, reading the translation. So we, we had to look at 
Dharma Chakrabartana Sutta's uh, important aspects from other suttas, and how does Dharma Chakrabartana Sutta convey the message, and all that. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to discuss as a review is the first uh, aspect here, yeah? one of the uh, two uh, wrong pursuits, Kama Sukhalikhanu Yoga. All right, Kama Sukhalikhanu Yoga. What does Kama Sukhalikhanu Yoga mean? Anybody? Kama Sukhalikhanu Yoga. We discuss in a certain way. Kama means sensuality. Sukha means Kama Sukha, pleasures, sensual pleasure. Allika, Allika. Really? Looks like that you are almost not remembering. Kama Sukha, Allika. Allika means clinging, clinging. Anu yoga means the practice, the practice of clinging to the sensual pleasures. Let's go to the text again a little bit. Uh, yeah, we discussed calm means sensual pleasure, sukha means happiness, alika means clinging to, anu yoga means practice application. So we discussed about karma and chanda, remember? This is an interesting uh, aspect of the sutta, karma and chanda. What is the difference between karma and chanda? Would you remember? Chanda? What does chanda mean? Now, when you, uh, when you look at most of the suttas about the right effort, Maybe seven board jangas, you would see chanda. Chandan janiti, viryang varabhati, chittam, uh, viryang, yeah, varabhati, chittam, paggan hati, chandan janiti. Chanda means desire. But this desire is ethically positive. I would say it is a good one. Let's say you want to, um, you want to do good karmas. Then what is that desire called? That is not karma, right? That is not karma. Now, when somebody asks somebody else, what what do you what do we call for someone who wants to attain so karma, sakadagami, anagami? It is a karma. What is the Pali word for that? Is it interesting? Somebody can ask you, well, you want to attain nibbana, right? Is it a karma or is it what is the proper word for that? It is a chanda. I have a chanda in attaining Nipa. I have a chanda in attaining Soka. I have a chanda in attaining Sakadaga. I have a chanda in going to the temple, going to the retreat, uh, offering flowers. Chanda, chanda. Not calm. That is very interesting. So, calm and chanda has a clear difference. So, whenever you want to do something good, then you have to use the Pali word called Chanda. At the same time, Chanda has a negative meaning also. Now, uh, in uh, one of the suttas, Buddha talks about that uh, you may be prejudiced. You may do some favorite things to other people. The Buddha said, Chanda dosa bayamo. People can be prejudiced. People can be biased on four things, four grounds. Chanda means nepotism, favoritism at that point. Dosa means anger. Because I'm angry, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take my friend's side. I don't want to take that person's side. Then Chanda, Dosa, Baya. Because I'm scared, I'm fear. So I, I'm going to take somebody else's side in this uh, drop. Moha, I'm very deluded. I'm distracted, so I'm going to take this side. The Buddha said, never ever make any decision being based on Chanda Dosa Bayaka. So in that teaching, Chanda is not always ethically positive. That is ethically positive, but it carries good and bad. Isn't it? It carries 
Now, at that point, Chanda can be good, Chanda can be bad. But when you see the, I would say, I would say uh, the overall Dhamma teaching, Chanda has to be taken as a Kusala effort. Right? Any likeness to do the Kusala. Right? That is what we understand by Chanda. So, Kama Sukalli Kama Yoga, there you see Kama, but here you understand Chanda. Chanda is a Chanda is the Pali word we use to discuss, mean about any good effort, any any uh, desire to do any good thing in your life. We discussed that. Huh? I'm not going to go into too many details. You can read that one. And then we discuss uh, calm as a part of Buddha's orderly speech. Right? Now, when somebody uh, comes to see the Buddha, Buddha always talks in an orderly manner. He does not talk about Nibbana in the first place. He talks about Dhana. Uh, you know, in that speech, he uh, brings the person into the negativity, I would say the disadvantages of the karma. So karma is a very good topic to learn. I think, I think uh, uh, most of the people in this world, beings, every being, is struggling with karma. It's, a, it's an unending uh, journey. Right? But if people... If people understand their karmas well, they will manage karmas well. The problem is not diminishing karmas. Nobody can diminish karma. What they can do is they can do a better management with their karmas. Right? Karma is important to learn. And then we learn karma as a part of the Mara. And then... Ah, this is interesting. This is a very interesting sutta. We call it Nibbedika Pariyaya Sutta. Nibbedika Pariyaya Sutta. In this particular sutta, Buddha says there are a couple Dhamma teachings which people have to understand by penetration. How can someone understand certain Dhamma matters? It could be karma, it could be something else by penetration. See this. Karma should be known. The course by which karma comes into play should be known. The diversity in karma should be known. The result of karma should be known. The cessation of karma should be known. And the path of practice for the cessation of karma should be known. What does it mean? Now, this is a very good way to understand our own karmas. Now, because we have karmas, more or less, to a certain degree, then we have to understand our own karmas. How can we understand our own karmas? We have to know our the causes of the karma. Why do I struggle with this particular karma? Then, what are the different types of karmas I may have? What are the things that have brought with my karmas? And karmas in this teaching is learning by penetration. So, don't learn this karma teaching as a mere teaching, like the like any other normal teaching. If so, you you will not make any progress with the karma. Buddha said, karma should be understood by penetration. Nibbedika. Penetration here means that you have to know how does my karma arise, what are the different types of karmas I have, how to stop my karma, and all that. So that is called uh, a teaching, a penetrative teaching. Karma as a Penetrative teaching. And this is also very interesting. We discussed that the karma is not an object. What do we think about the karmas? We think, ah, this person is my karma object. Without this person, I cannot survive. Uh, this particular food, this particular thing, this particular thing, and that is my karma. But the Buddha said, no. They are objects. But karma is just a conceptual what do you call it? It is a conceptual lust that you apply to certain objects. If you can get rid of that, if you can diminish that kind of thinking, then you can, uh, I would say, calm yourself. You can train yourself a lot. The Buddha said that there are no calm objects, but conceptual lust toward different, different objects. Right? We call it Sankhapara. It is also very interesting to learn about Kama Sukhali Yoga. 
and you can see all that. And, and we also discuss Kilesa Kama and Vattu Kama. I want you to tell me what they are. What is, is Kilesa Kama? What is Vattu Kama? Anybody? I thought you would come after reading the text a little bit, huh? some of the previous notes. It looks like I have to do the lesson again. <laughs> what is Vattu Kama? What is Kilesa Kama? Now, let's say that you have a liking towards somebody, something. What is it called? We call it Kilesaka. That is the first level. Right? In our life, can we? Can we do that? Now, you like something somebody, maybe you like a certain object, you like certain uh, goals in your life, but can you always make them happen onto you? You are not, right? In case you make them happen, let's say you are able to possess on such objects, we call it, uh, now you are going into the Vattu Kaam, Kiresa Kama and Vattu Kaam. So most of our karmas are lying at the level of kilesa karma. We like we like certain things, we like certain people, but we are not going to own them. Right? It's just like a dream. Huh? It arises and then it passes away even within our mindset. But there are certain times you are going to own, physically own those objects, those people. At that point, you are running into the what to come. Is it bad? No, no, it is not bad. Let's say you are you are falling in love with somebody and you are going to marry that person. It's not bad. I mean, but let's talk about other unnecessary karmas that you like these things, you like these people. You don't have to follow all those things. You have to, you have to have some restraint. You have to have some uh, what you call some limits. Your own moral limits, right? So you are going to make your um, uh, make sure that you are not going to pursue those objects. That means you don't go into what to come. You are only struggling with the Kilesa Kamas and you are going to, I would say, get it up Kilesa Kamas also at a certain point. Very interesting teaching. Now for those people who are uh, remorseful, who are regretful about their past, you can think about, okay, I had some Kilesas, but maybe they are Kilesa Kamas, not what to come. I did not own them. <laughs> I had Kilesa Kamas. I, I like those things in my mind, but I did not go on them. So, no what to Kamas. Okay? Then we discuss a couple more things. Dangers of Kamas. That's it. So, overall, what we understood by the Kamas of Kandikanu Yoga was that a clinging, a clinging to the a clinging to the karmas. This is the issue. Right? So this is really bringing us lots of issues. Physical issues, mental issues, emotional issues. Sometimes it, uh, it can carry a lot of damages to us too. Right? Now when you are someone who is going to uh, uh, who is going to have a lot of mortgages, loans, then in the finances, how, how are you characterized by the finances? You have you have lots of there's a word you have lots of liabilities, payback stuff, huh? payback ten years, thirty years, amortization, huh? mortgage, maybe loans, huh? so these are mental liabilities. If you are clinging to the karmas, you have to pay back with your life. Mental liabilities. I don't think nobody needs mental liabilities. We want freedom. It doesn't mean that you cannot commit to somebody. Commit to somebody. Yes, you can take care of that person. And you can uh, practice O Brahma Viharas to your mother, to your father, to your whoever. Girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, wife, husband. They're good. I mean, 
when you have those people around, you can practice metta, karuna, mudita, upika easily. But they are next to you. Right? If you don't have, then you have to do it in a certain different. But do not create unnecessary karma liabilities. You will never pay back. The effects will come after you. So karma sutalikani yoga in your lay life, to my understanding is that go for healthy karmas. Buddhism is not denying karmas for the lay people. James did, uh, deny. You cannot go to any karmas. Buddha says, no, I'm not going to deny karmas. People need karmas, but they have to understand their parameters of the karmas and they should look for healthy karmas. That is why the Buddha said, Kami Sumicha Chara Viraman. What does Kami Sumicha Chara mean? Kami Sumicha Chara means that you are happy with your whoever the person you are. Right? This is what the Buddha said. Buddha said it is a, an important thing. Taking care of a family is a blessing. Isn't it? Where did the Buddha say that? Where did he say so? Mata pitu upattana, taking care of the mother and father, is a blessing. Putta dara sasangam, taking care of the children and uh, spouse is a blessing. Right? It is a blessing. He never uh, rejected. If somebody is not that, then that person has to find out that happiness in a different way. But it is a blessing. He never neglected that. So karma, so karma sukhalikani over here means that never ever cling to karmas, regardless of you being a lay person or a monk, honestly. All right? Then atta kilamatani. Atta kilamatani. The third day we discuss about it. Uh, atta kilamata. Atta means self. Kilamata means fatigue. Anuyoga practice. That means when you practice your sila, whatever your dhamma practice, never ever create any fatigue after the practice. Can you tell me an example? Have you ever met this issue in your life? You are going for a meditation retreat and you know you cannot meditate being on the floor. Then should you keep trying to be on the floor? You know you cannot. Go and grab a chair and sit on the chair. Right? I'm sure the monastics are very compassionate to say that. <laughs> Probably I tell people, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, don't be here. Go grab a chair and sit down. Because this is not this is not trying to give pain to our body. Meditation is not giving pain to the body. Meditation is understanding our mind better than when you don't meditate. That is one very small example. Other examples in your normal life, tell me from the Sila part. Have you ever felt any fatigue, any, I would say, weariness with your sila practice? Can you give me a very simple example? Uh, mosquitoes, uh, mosquitoes come into your house and then should I kill or not? This is the simple uh, question. So don't ask me this question. <laughs> what about why the mosquitoes came into your house? Maybe you have opened your window, you have opened your door, you are not cleaning your house properly, you are not keeping it clean and tidy. Maybe there is an issue in your house. Maybe you have run into a certain area. Right? The good question is, have I done the necessary things so that unnecessary mosquitoes run, not come into my house? That is a good question. Right? Not asking, should I kill or not, because they are going to attack me. Right? That is going to be a little bit, uh, you know, different question. So, I think now the problem is my seal. Now, a lay person is to ask, Pante Panatipata, uh, right? Should I kill or not? So, ah, that is the point, weariness, that you feel that you feel compelled to kill them or not. So, why you, why you bring your seal of practice into that kind of a 
very difficult situation. So you could do certain things to stop that happening. Right? So there are many examples you can think about. Never ever bring your sealer to pressurize you. Someone who practices sealer never bring it to a level of pressurization. He, he does not, she does not pressurize. He is not pressurized by the sealer. Sealer is a very uh, comfortable, motivational practice to that person. But for many people, I don't think it is. They they feel like sealer is trying to, you should, you should be, you know. They feel like it's kind of intimidating in a certain way. You know, they might not feel it in that way, but they, they understand. So never ever bring your sealer to intimidate your peace, right? You are going to look at uh, the sources of uh, what you call akusalas, and you are going to uh, prevent unnecessary sources of, uh, you know, making you to do any unnecessary akusalas, and then you are going to practice the sealer as it is, right? not too excessive, not too uh, unnecessary. Because if you practice sealer excessively, then what will happen? You are not you are not going to attain sota panya anytime soon. Why is it? This is one of the fetters that the Buddha said that what distance people from becoming a sota panya. Because then then think about it. If somebody is doing a lot of sealer, over sealer, then that person must be a sota panya, definitely. But he is not, she's not. Why? That, he, that itself is a fetter, impediment, hindrance to the to becoming a sota. Don't take it that serious. Don't take sila that seriously. But do the necessary. Never kill, never steal, never misbehave, never lie, never cloud your mind. That's it. Nothing more than that. That's enough. Sila has a certain moral compass, certain, certain moral so, there are a lot of things you can think about that might have uh, made you weary or fatigue. Never ever spiritually fatigue. Right? That is going to be an issue to your practice. That is Atta Kilamatami Yoga. Alright, so you can read that. You can see how the Buddha taught uh, Atta Kilamatami Yoga. And then we discussed the Noble Eightfold Path. We said that uh, there is a misconception about the Noble Eightfold Path and the Satipatthanas. What was it? I want to ask you. I told you that there's a misconception between the Satipatthana Suttas, uh, Satipatthana Suttas abstract and the Noble Eightfold Path and trusted Buddhist teachings. What was it? In the Satipatthana Sutta, there is a, there is a very famous Suddhya Soka Paridavana Sampikama Dukkha Domana Sana Nathangama Yadidan Chattaru Satipatta Ekainu Ayambikavi Mano. Some people misunderstood. They thought the only path is Satipatta. The only path is Satipatta to become uh, Sota initiate. It is not how we have to understand. The only path is the noble eight for path. Satipatthana is inside of that. Because it comes under Sammasa. That thing you have to understand very clearly. I clearly emphasize that. Satipatthanas go under the Sammasa. Right? So, uh, that is very interesting. That we need to understand that. Satipatthana Sutta's whole analysis and synthesis go under the Sammasati, which comes out. Uh, I, I suspect uh, any misunderstanding must have come from the 19th century uh, Vipassana movement from different countries, Burma, uh, because uh, this was a time that, uh, uh, what do you call Colonization has happened in Burma, Sri Lanka, and all these countries. So, 
they had to show the Westerners that uh, we have some very radical enlightenment uh, elements in our teachings. But in the early Buddhism, in early Buddhism, what is early Buddhism? Diganikaya, Majjhimanikaya, Sangyutta Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya. This is Buddhism, early Buddhism. Theravada, Theravada, Theravada is a teaching that has a lot of other books, but early Buddhism is Diga Majjhima Sangyutta Anguttara, whereby Theravada came up, Mahayana came up, and all the other branches came up. In early Buddhism, we find that it is only the noble eightfold path, which we understand by the sole path to attain it, becoming a soul Amana and the rest. That thing we discussed uh, during the Noble Eightfold Path, day four. Then we discuss one by one of the path factors, some Riti, some Sankhapa, and so forth. Now, let me ask you, probably I'm not going to open up all these uh, links. I might ask you some basic questions about Samma Ditti. Tell me, what does Ditti play in our practice? Why, why do we have to start our path from the Ditti? So Dhamma path from Samasati, why not? Maybe from Samavacha? Maybe from Samakamma? Why can't we start our path from Dhamma journey from those things? But why the Buddha asked to start from Samadhi? Anybody tells me because I already explained to you. Why can't we start from other, probably uh, other path factors? Why we have to start from Samadhi? Oh, there is somebody. You want to come forward? Yeah, you want to come forward and then uh, ask a question. Yes, very good. Yes, it is the foundation. It is the foundation. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is the foundation. Now you think about, you are going to make a house without the foundation. What will happen to the house? You are trying to build the walls and all these things, but there is no good solid foundation. What will happen to the house after that? It will fall down. Maybe it, it will be, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, you know, sucked away by natural disasters. Now, let me tell you, a lot of people might think this is something very simple. It is not simple. It's not trivial. You may talk, you may act, you may live your life according to your way of uh, making money. You may practice meditation. You may concentrate your mind. Whatever you do as such, will not going to be successful if you do not start any of those practices with Samadhi. Samadhi is the, the bedrock, the foundation of our practice. Your Dhamma journey has to be on a solid foundation of Samadhi. What is Samadhi? Samadhi initially means that we believe, we respect, 10 things, right? We believe in dana, we believe in giving, we believe in uh, kusala kusala kamas, we uh, consider our mother is a special person, we consider our father is a... Why we have to think that our father, mother, they are special people for our Dhamma journey? What is the connection? Gratitude. You cannot practice your Dhamma journey, start your Dhamma journey without being grateful to the people who brought you into this world. Gratitude. Now this is the problem you, when somebody starts from Samma Sati meditation itself. You just practice it something for that day and then don't know where I'm heading, why I started this practice. For what? That is why Samma Ritti prepares anybody to the whole practice. Now let's take the second one, Samma Sankhapa. The Buddha says, only when you have Samma Ditti, you will have Samma Sankha. But this is the other very interesting area. Why is it? Only when you have good view, right view, then the right intentions keep starting. Otherwise, you won't have uh, thoughts of intentions of not killing, not harassing other people, even 
renunciation thoughts, intentions. They will not arise in you. No. In our reading of the many suttas, not even Dhammachakapata Sutta, what I understand is that you cannot practice Sammasati without practicing Sammati. You will do something, but it is not Samma. It is just a Sati. It is just a Sankha. Because they have to start from that Samadhi point. Okay. Let's say now I have Samadhi, then whatever the intentions that come to my mind, they are Samma Sankha. Definitely Samma Sankha. Then when I have Samma Sankha, everything that I speak, whatever the words that come out of my speech, they're going to be Samadhi. Why? They are rooted in the Samadhi. I cannot lie to anybody. I cannot talk behind the back. I cannot slam. I cannot hurt anybody because I know somebody thing. I cannot do that. I know karma vipak. I know good bad karmas. I cannot do that. I cannot gossip. Why? If I gossip, I know there are certain consequences that I learned from somebody. So directly, somebody also directly connected to somebody. Then. Samma Kamma, my actions. Because I know Kamma, good Kamma, bad Kamma, I cannot kill anybody. I cannot steal. I cannot misbehave. Because I learned that when I start from Samma, my right being is rooted upon those ethical values. Then Samma Kamma, Samma Aji. Then as a lay person, you may do a certain job. You, you cannot you cannot be jobless, some you have work. My job. What kind of job? Or maybe how do I do my job? I know when I start my practice at the level of somebody, the right wheel, I cannot cheat other people to make money. It's a part of the karma. I cannot cheat. I cannot mislead people with my products in my job. Always go back to Samadhi. Then, Samavayama. Now we have come to the very important point of your Samadhi practice now. Now I have the very good ethical practice based on my Samadhi. Now, what about my Vayam, my effort now? You know that everybody thinks that they all have to be hard working. The Samma uh, Vayama means hard working. What does Samma Vayama mean? Now, already in the society, they have a uh, dialogue between uh, hardworking people and lazy people. So, do we have to choose uh, hardworking people to talk about Samma Vayama? What does Samma Vayama mean? Samma Vayama means not hardworking. You cannot hard work for the dumb. Dhamma is not a hard work in practice. It's a smooth, smart practice. Just because you practice a lot of Sira for uh, 10 years, it doesn't guarantee you will do the rest better on the first day of the 11th year. It is a smooth, smart practice. Let me tell you a very interesting story. There was a very virtuous Sila monk uh, who practiced Sila very well, perfectly. But one day, something happened to him in his very, I would say, in his response. What a big deal, nothing happened. Nothing happened, nobody was hurt. But it is said in the Vinaya that uh, uh, plants, they have a certain life. The Buddha said, do not cut the trees. Well, they have a certain life. So, because of this teaching, Breaking a branch is kind of a very small, uh, I would say, a small mistake in the Vinaya. Right? He, he, ha he had not done anything wrong. But when he was going to pass away, he was thoughtful about this thing. Oh, I was so good, but this happened. Then what happened to him? He passed away. He became a very big cobra in the monastery. In the monastery. Why is it? 
because he passed away with anger hatred because he had self hatred ah, i did that mistake i did it i did it i couldn't have done it the buddha said if you did the mistake then try not to do it again don't keep thinking about it the more you think about it the more you are uh, giving self hatred now what i understand is that particular monk had no samadhi only sila that's why he could not concentrate on whatever the good things he did he only picked up the bad small bad thing that is unnecessary it's like a, there's a white board and you see a, a black mark somewhere in the white board and you're picking on the black mark you don't look at that the rest of the larger space of the white board right that's why i'm saying it's a smart practice a lot of people cannot do that buddhist practice is a smart practice not not a cunning practice it's a smart practice smooth smart practice otherwise a lot of people make mistakes even within within being a good people right so uh, this is a very interesting point samavaya means not hard working just because you hard just because you are so much tired with lot of dhamma programs it doesn't guarantee you are going to be reborn in a good place it does not guarantee you are progressing a lot so but if you know the path well some of it is some of some of some of the 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 all right so what is some of the some of the it is not a hard working practice don't hard work for dhamma just do it in a good way with good intentions we does not guarantee it. what is samavayama i i think you remember that i am going to give you a clue remember that i talked about a vegetable gardening project remember ah uh, then how did i connect uh, samavayama to the vegetable gardening project there are four things four things that we have to do in our dharma practice the first one removal second one prevention third one third one creating fourth one maintenance removing existing active apusalas preventing inactive apusalas they are not with you creating inactive kusalas maintaining deepening active kusalas let me explain a little bit more removing in a uh, active apusalas that means you have a vegetable garden you can take it as a as a simile for that you you already have what you call weeds and unnecessary things I mean, let's start from the prevention let's say you have a vegetable garden you don't have weeds so far so does that guarantee that weeds will not come to your garden it won't so you have to prevent let's say you are not that bad huh? but does it guarantee that you will not be bad in the future it won't so the buddha said prevent any uh, inactive apusalas remove existing uh, what you call active apusalas and then create new apusalas tell me an example create new apusalas anybody wants to say how you can create a new pusala that that you haven't done it before pusala how to create a new pusala how many pusalas do we have how many pusalas do we have skillful activities do we have to, can we do n pusala activities can you divide them into 10 uh, tree i i can make it a little easier how many kusala activities we can do by the mind by the speech by the body three kusalas by the mind three kusalas by the body four kusalas by the by the speech that means we can do more kusalas by the mouth huh? by the speech focuses 
because after you do a good karma you might talk about it right it's like some people do the postmortem of the good karma so huh? postmortem they do a big big ceremony and then after that they talk about it they are lucky if they can only talk about good stuff about that <laughs> not getting ended up by choosing people so there are three kusala activities by your mind not this one is not being covetous not too much, not too much greedy about it then not having ill will not having mechadit these are the three kusalas that you can do by your mind what about the body not killing other pe- beings not stealing other people's stuff not misbehave by the body then by the mouth by the speech what are they by not uh, not lying not uh, slandering not hurting other people not gossiping i will tell you so now these are the things you can the, the opposite of these ten how do we see the opposite always try to let go and be to be a general become a generous person always trying to wish good things for other people for your enemies even your enemies does buddhism tell you to uh, uh, spread the hate to anybody just because something happened from that person can you hate can does does the buddha say you can hate someone because that person done something wrong to you you can but you may it might be a tough thing to do but if you understand buddhism you will never think about even doing it so not uh, having ill will not that means having someone so if you look at the opposite of these 10 you will find out new kusalas right let's say you are not someone who is uh, thinking how how your speech can hurt other people but one day you get to understand that i have some problems in my speech when i talk maybe the way i talk will be more straight and then other people get offended by my speech then from that day onwards you are going to be a little bit careful about your speech then what are you doing here you are creating a new person you haven't done it before so things like that you are creating new kusala so having effort to create new kusala the last one under samma sanka uh, samma uh, why am i stand you are going to maintain your existing kusalas right so this is called samma vaya now is samma vaya very important it is very very important because another very uh interesting issue that a lot of buddhist people are going through is inconsistent practice what do i mean by inconsistent practice they practice for one or two months and then after that they are they feel very lazy about dhamma practice i don't want to do anything maybe another three four months i'm going to do it again dhamma practice is a committed practice you don't have to be very much uh, struggling if you struggle let me tell you if you struggle in your dharma talk to a teacher whoever who can guide you to struggle in your practice whatever the practice maybe meditation maybe your sila practice samadhi panya right so inconsistent dharma practice comes from laziness people become lazy in their dharma practice. you should not be lazy lazy does not mean that you are going to sleep La- being lazy means that you are not adequately committing to the uh development of the kusala activities that is the inconsistency by laziness samavayama helps you not to do that samavayama always gives you in- enough strength to practice it all day long all night long all the time 24 365 not one day two day one week two week one it is a continuous practice then samma sati samma sama samma sati what did we learn with samma sati as i already mentioned to you we said samma sati as it is very popular 
is not a way, it's not a stand alone practice. Samasati has to be practiced after Samaditi, Sakapa, Vacha, Samadha, Ajiv, Vayama. Along that practice, you come to Samasati. But once you practice seven, uh, eight factors individually, then when you practice, you practice everything together. Right? It's like that you learning how to drive. I first try to get used to the steering wheel and you get used to the gears, you get used to other things. But finally, you have to drive with everything together, right? At the same time. You can't just do one thing, right? You're going to do everything at the same time. Initially, you're going to learn one by one slowly. Just to just to master yourself about that particular activity. All right. Samasati means practicing different anupasanas. Do we have to practice all satipatthanas to become a sotapatta? Or maybe perhaps uh, becoming a, an arahant? Do we have to? Do we have a very simple question? <laughs> maybe you should ask this question from among, I'm asking from you. Do we have to practice all satipatthanas, kaya, vedana, chitta, dhamma, to attain, to become a sutrapan? Do we? No, we don't have to. We don't have to. Why? There's a shortcut. Not a shortcut, but it's an interesting shortcut. If you practice anapanasati well, it covers all satipatthanas. It covers Vedana, it covers Chittanupasana, it covers Dhammanupasana. Where is it given in the suttas? Anapana Sati Sutta Majimanika. Buddha says, if somebody practices Anapana Sati meditation in the proper way, uh, not, the, not these recent ways, uh, the proper way as given in the suttas. Always go back to the suttas. The proper way, especially Anapana Sati Sutta. Then that person can bring that anapana sati to one's own feelings, one's own thoughts, sickness, chitta person. I sixteen practicing. That is up to them. Someone might say, "No, I'm gonna choose maybe dhamma anapasana." Some of the dhamma anapasana things, but the Buddha said. If you practice Anapanasati well, then you will practice. It, the same practice covers Vedana Chittada. And I already explained to you in many of uh, those sessions, previous sessions. But now I'm asking you a very interesting question. What is it? Uh, why Anapanasati, I would say, breathing breathing exercise which comes under kind of asana is so important why is it i already explained to you in our sessions in the samasati session why how many of you have practiced breath meditation before how many oh most of you have practiced and why is breath meditation very important? What are you doing in the breath meditation? Counting your breaths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Huh? Is it? Or oh, looking at your tummy, yeah? Huh? My tummy is right, you know. <laughs> These are modern, modern, modern breath meditation, huh? The vipassana moon, start in the suttas, looking at your tummy and looking at other places, modern books. They are not in the suttas. Uh, why? It is said that when you practice breath meditation, what you do is that you are watching your breaths. The breaths come up with different styles long, short, maybe a mixture, whatever other variances. Whatever you do with the breath meditation as such is that you're going to watch your breaths arising 
and then existing breaths and then how they pass away, how they perish away. In other ways, what you are doing overall is that you are going to refine your breaths, isn't it? You are going to refine your breaths. Now you see, people refine a lot of things. Huh? They refine sugar, they refine material, they refine crude oil, isn't it? They refine everything in the world. In the breath meditation, you are refining your breath. What will happen to you when you refine your breath? What, what is this re refining? When you watch your breath, you are refining the breath. The more you refine your breath, the calmer you are. When you watch your breath, you know what are the physical attributes of your emotions. Let's say you're angry. What will happen? How do you know you get angry? Do we have indications that come up with our anger? Our jealousy? Especially anger, irritation. When anger arise, uh, arises in you, uh, does it give you any indications? Yes. How do we notice them? Through the breaths. Through the breaths. You feel that I'm having a heavy breath, maybe I'm puffing. Ah, then this is what we're going to look at. This is what we're going to watch. Then the true, true breath meditation is how to watch your breaths when you are negative in your emotions. Let's say you run into an argument with somebody in your household. Have you ever looked at your breaths? Or you are going to defend yourself in that event? What did you normally do? Let's say there's a big argument going on, then you may have not seen your breaths. The Buddha says that if you watch your breaths, then you see how anger is slowly arising. How it is going to give you a hard time. Anger, jealousy, indignation, frustration, irritation, annoyance, all those emotions come. When, whenever they come, there are changes in your breaths. That is why breath meditation is so, so important. Right? That is why. Then you see your emotions. At the same time, you see your different thoughts. Ah, now I'm so angry. Because whatever I like is not happening now. So I'm going to do something for that. Then, then you see your chitta anupasana level. You see your thoughts going haywire at that point because of anapans. Your feelings go haywire. You see because of anapans. Then you have to say, thank you anapans sati because I see my feelings because of you. Thank you chitta. Thank you anapans sati because I see my thoughts because of you. Because of you. This is the way, you know, how we look at it. So this is what we understand by uh, the most important practice of Satipatthana, Sutta, Samasati, Anapanasati. Anapanasati is the bedrock in Samasati. Uh, on top of that, so let me tell you, uh, you don't have to practice all the exercises of Satipatthana. Just practice some uh, Anapanasati as a main practice, but you can also practice Sampajanya and Iriyata. Posture meditation and then uh, full awareness. I think that's enough. Other things, because you don't need to cover up everything. What you want to cover up is what is mattering to your practice. So start from some uh, Anapanasati and then practice a couple others and then bring that practice to Vedanapasana, Chittanapasana, Dhammapasana. Covers everything. That is Sammasana. Samma Samadhi, the last one. Now, as a consequence of a very deep and committed, continued, consistent practice of Samasati, you are going into Samadhi. For jhanas, not even for jhanas, then you are shifting your focus of your thoughts, mind onto the Vipassana, Samatha Vipassana, right? And then what happens? Where is Panya? Why there is no path factor for Panya, no Samma Panya, right? <laughs> Where is it? When you practice Samma Samadhi well, Panya arises naturally. It swells out of the Samma Samadhi. It naturally arises. Whatever you think is wise. Whatever you talk is wise. Whatever you do is wise. You are a wise person overall. You are a full wise person. 
this is what we discuss about the uh, path factors. Well, let me uh, cover up a little bit more. Now, at the uh, what do you call uh, day 14, day 15, day 16, day 17, again, we did about first noble truth, what is Dukkha, then this is the Tantha, the Beast Pose, and then this is the Cessation Nibbana, and this is again the uh, Eightfold Noble Eightfold Path. Finally, the last three days, what we discussed what was the was this Dharma Chakra teaching? This Dharma Chakra teaching is, teaching is the very important one. We say the four noble truths have to be understood through the Parivartha three aspects and twelve perspectives. I think you can read that because time is going uh, very fast. That is what makes this Sutta to get the name of Dharma Chakra. A lot of people misunderstand Dhamma Chakra is a wheel and it goes from here to somewhere. No. Dhamma Chakra, the word Dhamma Chakra has come to this sutta because of the Tipari Vata Dwada Sankara teaching of the Four Noble Truths. That is why the sutta took Dhamma Chakra. It's not about a wheel that goes from one place to other place. But when the Buddha uh, taught Dhamma, uh, what he called the Four Noble Truths teaching with Tipari Vata Dwada Sankara in many places, people understood it at the same time it was spread in that perspective otherwise it did not spread as a V. so uh, setting the dhamma dhamma chakra in, in motion is giving the giving the four noble truths with three perspectives and 12 aspects all right and it is repeatedly said that nobody can set the dhamma wheel in motion other than the buddha because only Buddha, uh, Samma, some Buddha can teach the Four Noble Truths according to the three perspectives and to an aspect. The Parivakta Dvansa. Others count. Others will just say uh, there are Four Noble Truths. Huh? They cannot teach it with the uh, framework of the Parivakta Dvansa. All right. Finally, the last two was the, the cry that went to uh, different heavens, six heavens and then 16 Brahma worlds. And you see this word Dhamma Chakku. Dhamma Chakku is what you call the eye that uh, is receiving by anybody who attains Sotapan. In this case, Monk Kondanya became a Sotapan. All right. Uh, any questions about the uh, whole Dhamma Chakka Pathana Sutta? Because today is the last day for our uh, discussion about the Dhamma Chakka Pathana Sutta. It's been how many months? It's been almost. Uh, Four and a half, four months and a half that we took. <laughs> yes, uh, this is the least actually. Might have gone a little further, but. Oh.